Hey everyone, welcome to Film Snobbery Live. I am your host, uh, the film snob, Nick Baisley, and I am joined tonight, as I am every night, by my co-host, Jerry Cavallaro. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Nick. Jerry, we have a fantastic show tonight. I know we do. I know. I'm excited. You're excited. It's, it's, it's big deal stuff. Now, uh, I, I'm going to go... Everyone's excited. Everyone's excited. All the people in the chat room, I'm very... Uh, um, <laughs> Um, Gary, Gary King, who's in the chat room, says, doing taxes and listening in. So apparently we make good background noise for, uh, for tax preparation. Um, uh, Gary, don't forget that big deduction for, uh, for consulting with me. So when you get that, uh, that uh, check-in, you, know, you can always you know, pay me back on that deferral. Wink, wink. Um, no, we do have a fantastic show for you tonight. Uh, coming up, we have uh, uh, our guest, Nathan Cole, uh, who's a screenwriter producer of the movie The Waterhole. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, kind of making mistakes in, in indie film, uh, learning from those mistakes, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just, you know, what he's up to in general. Um, after that, <coughs> we got a phone call, apparently, because uh, <laughs> I forgot to mute my phone. Um, <laughs> uh, after that, we've got, uh, we're going to cut to a commercial. When we come back from that, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk. Uh, we have some questions uh, from a, a few Q&A sessions we did on Twitter recently. Um, some people were having some questions regarding uh, marketing on social media, so we wanted to kind of address that in a more uh, larger than 140 character format. So here we are, and we're going to talk about that later on in the show, so stick around for that. So uh, without any further ado, I want to bring to you guys the man that I think of whenever I see a Nathan Hot Dog commercial. Uh, Nathan Cole. Really? That's how this is going to start. That, uh, that should how it, that's how it should finish. That's how it should how finish? It, uh, how are you, we sir? We start at the bottom. Absolutely. We way up. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, like I said, I have to mention Paul Osborne's balls like several times during this interview. I don't know if um, anyone is aware of that pact I made with him, but um, might as well get that, uh, that sort of flavor going right away. You mean official rejections, Paul Osborne? That the one and only, and soon to be uh, a director of uh, a favor. Fa well, he is a director, but is the director. Yet. Yes, favor, and, and uh, uh, successfully crowdfunded movie favor. Um, exactly. We're gonna, we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit about that as well. Um, I want to, first of all, how have you been? How have I been? I've been, I've been all right. I've been all right, you know. How, how, what, uh, what, have, what have you been up to, like, you know, recently? For those who, for those who don't know what the waterhole is or, or what you, who you are or what you do, why don't you go ahead and, and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and, and kind of what you've been up to. Oh, my God, that's my least favorite part of this job. Well, that's uh, why we're getting it out earlier. Yeah, I, four years, well, I, you know, over ten years ago, I wrote the script The Waterhole. I moved to L.A. in 2000 and spent like eight years trying to get it made, uh, then spent the next four years trying to get people to see it. And we were released on DVD a little under a year ago, um, just came out on some instant sites and VOD sites a few months ago, and just like I've been whoring it out as much as I can. Our lead actor, pa Patrick J. Adams, is starting to become a big name and getting us some fan base uh, because of that. And... Uh, just trying to make money at this uh, this uh, job of indie filmmaking, which is almost impossible. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. You want to go through all that again? No, I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> and cut. Perfect. Um, moving on to the next. No, so you you've got you, you know you're out in uh, in Los Angeles, someplace that we're going to be in the very near future. Yes, um, and I want to hear more about that. Yeah, me I might too. start interviewing you at any point during this uh, conversation. That that's fine because I'll be honest with you, I still have no idea what the hell I'm doing out there. Um, in, in as much as um, all of my plans have not been solidified yet, I'm still waiting to hear back on a couple of different things. But I do know that I'm driving out there. We've got a few stops along the way that we're going to go visit some indie film friends of ours and uh, and some other friends of mine that aren't. It related to indie film in the least, and uh, and then we're uh, we're we're gonna we're that's it. I'm I'm gonna be a a California resident um, from there on in. So uh, you are you have the the pleasure of being on one of the last. Uh, I think we only have like four or five more shows total. So you're in the you know the one of the last Massachusetts studio shows. 
But will there be LA studio shows? Well, that's something that's part of the uh, deal that we're working on right now. Supposedly, there is a like a 95% chance that we will have a, a brand new studio to use uh, that is uh, professional and awesome and you know groovy and all. Um, but we'll have a lot more information about all that kind of stuff that we're going to release after March 1st when we launch our Indiegogo campaign. So, see I'm how I very say, excited for you. See and how I can I already predict that no matter what happens here in Los Angeles, it's going to result in magic. <laughs> well, I, that's because the isn't the magic. Well, one of the magic kingdoms there, Disneyland. <laughs> uh, it is, so. and if you can tolerate people, it's quite magical. See, I, I oh, I'm not a I'm not a people person. I hate everyone. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, we're we've got a lot of. Some, Go ahead. I have to make one recommendation, though, and like you know, and maybe this is a good perk on your Indiegogo campaign. Sure. That when the show relaunches in Los Angeles, you know, the, the capital of entertainment and film and TV, that you bring back screening the trailers before, and you put my poster up. <laughs> oh, is that what you're gonna? Be? That's that's how is that a perk? Oh, oh, the trailer part, right? Like no, 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 like so, so you know, somebody could sponsor <laughs> that feature. Ah, so what you're saying is is kind of like as we're designing the new set and all that because we're right now we're on a green screen set because of just necessity for the most part. Um, so once we have a brand new set to work with, that part of the set design should incorporate more movie posters and stuff, as well as you're saying that as we're uh, running, tr you know, before the show like we used to do when we use live stream, we should run the trailers on a 24 loop, 24 seven loop. Yeah, I mean, I'm just feeling a bit nostalgic before we actually get on to something uh, besides you and I chatting about the history of your show. Uh, and I can't believe Jerry hasn't put a stop to this yet. Like, where is, why, what kind of uh, co-host is this? He's, he's letting us ramble on. He's a very quiet co-host, just the I way I like him. I don't have any him. control over this show. I'm not even supposed to speak. I'm not supposed to be speaking right now. Sorry, <laughs> Nick. Uh... <laughs> Jerry says uh, in the chat room, for those of you guys who aren't in the chat room for some reason, says, as I've said before, I predict Nick will be in costume outside Men's Chinese Theater in two months. <laughs> He's probably right. As it is, I'm, I'm expecting to have to live in my car for the first month I'm there. I really do. I'm, I, I have no... Uh, I have no arrangements uh, set up yet for a uh, uh, place to live, uh, couch or wherever. So I'll be in uh, my little tiny uh, Toyota Yaris that I will be driving out there with. So, tiny car. <laughs> tiny car. Tiny, tiny always, car. You're always welcome at my house, but not between the hours of midnight and 5 in the morning. <laughs> but any other time, you're welcome here. Any other, any other time. <laughs> Thanks, all that. I just have to find a place to sleep from 12 to 5. <laughs> Um, but uh, but let's 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 go ahead and let's talk a little bit more about uh, the waterhole. Now we we had mentioned, and one of the things that you wanted to talk about was mistakes that you that that can be made in making and or producing and or promoting a movie. And, and this is something we've gone over a little bit with uh, Jerry in terms of mostly like promoting uh, specifically crowdfunding and stuff like that. But we haven't really uh, addressed anything outside of movies like Stuck Like Chuck 2 or, or those you know, movies that it's just they, they fail so miserably. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your uh, movie here and some of the, the mistakes. What's the biggest mistake, first of all, you think you made? Yeah, and, uh, I, I'm like, I love to beat up on myself, so I could probably list a ton. I think the first was, and I've written about this before, is that I, we really did, my partner Daniel and I, approached this so naively in terms of all we need to do is make a movie and then put it out there in the world and people embrace it, right? So, um, and, and part of that was sort of a great experience because we just, we did not care what anyone thought. We would just wanted to make it as best as we could the way we wanted to, and that's fine, and I, I still, I don't regret that decision, but to sort of naively, you know, think that, oh, we're going to submit it to a bunch of film festivals, and if it's good enough, we're going to get in, and that's that. Then the rest takes care of itself, uh, where do we start cashing the checks? Do you feel that, really, do, do you feel that, uh, just kind of uh, something you said regarding the, you know, submitting it to film festivals, and if it's good enough, 
you know, moving on. But do you do you feel that the film festivals are representative of like that movies that get in are good, or is it that the movies that got in just happen to fit a festival kind of their profile, or is it subjective? Is it nepotism? Is it you know whatever? What what is your kind of feeling on? Oh, it's, it's obviously all of those things. I mean, you know, as much and I and I can take a very cynical uh, approach to this. And actually, since I don't want to mention the person you uh, uh, talked about at the opening of of the uh, the show, <laughs> but you know, his film got rejected to some big festivals. And I think you know, I was talking with some other filmmakers about this in the last week that it's like a travesty. It's a total travesty. His films so good and so original and it should definitely be and I don't know if I want to mention it yet so I won't but if you feel like guessing <laughs> but anyway so the point of that you know, what I'm getting to is that so you know a lot of great films don't get in a lot of great films do I just watched Take Shelter last night from which debuted at Sundance and I loved it and I think it was a, a great independent film but I think on the balance the, the, the system's definitely not in your favor if you don't have the right connections mm -hmm. and you're not sort of position in the whole grooming process of, you know, either having the right sales agents or part of, like, the mentorship programs or, no, you know, filmmakers that are in good graces or have actors that they just love. I mean, there's all these factors that will work against you if you don't have them, you know, in your, in your film. And, and uh, no, I, I did realize that I, I had cut you off before you were going to make a point, but I did, just to, as an aside for the film festival kind of thing, um, <clears throat> but what were you, uh, you going to say as far as we were talking about some of those mistakes and, and stuff like that as far as uh, where you felt you had these expectations that, you know, uh, the, the, the big cha-ching was coming and, and uh, apparently that didn't happen? Yeah, no, I mean, look, uh, a lot of that is just, being completely naive and being completely optimistic because making a film is such a challenge and getting a film made is such a challenge and to do it is such an incredible accomplishment. And anyone who does it, and anyone, you talk to anyone, they'll say like, well, I made a movie, what now? And they'll be like, first of all, be proud of yourself. And that's happened a million times from a lot of different people in the you know, different levels of the industry to me. But, you know, at the same time, you know, so many films get made that that to kind of expect that just because yours is watchable will get in these festivals is just, I mean, it's just, it's like, like, like believing in Santa Claus when you're 20 years old type of thing. So, um, and, and not having a plan going in, you know, you know, going into that situation was just incredibly stupid <laughs> for us. And, and now, so did you Did you not really have, like, a, a fully formed, like, I mean, I'm guessing you had a festival plan, which was, let's submit to a bunch of fests, regardless of... Exactly. Yeah. You're like, hey, well, what's the budget going to be? And then you start spending money, and you're like, why am I spending all this, like, how did this get up there so quickly? Like, why am I, you know, paying to submit to some festival? And, and I mean, basically, I, I, I was like, the, the price is right for me. Was like, uh, what looks good? that I could possibly bid on and um, actual retail prices you know, <laughs> exactly it's like well you know yeah, a trip to, I've never been to Kansas City let's apply there that sounds fun um, and we're just throwing money away and you know it, like it was a hard learning experience but a valuable one and, and what is the biggest thing that you learned from that? Like, it, you know, would you go into it with a far more researched festival plan after this, or would you... Oh, yeah. You, would you even... I would, I would not, I would not <clears throat> submit to more than, like, five or ten at the very most festivals. I'd make sure that I was doing everything I could communicate with festival programmers or anybody that had any sort of... Uh, um, um, role in the festival or new people in the festival, I mean, I, I would just consolidate on those festivals because if you get into a Sundance or a South by Southwest, you're going to get into all the other festivals. So, but, and, and this is not to knock any other festival, and we debuted at, at Newport Beach Film Festival, which was a great festival, and so, but in terms of just sort of building awareness of your film, no, those are great experiences, but they're not really <coughs> pushing you into that, that area you want to be if you want to break through. Do you feel that, you know, in, in if you're only going to go to like, you know, say t 10 festivals, are you going to just go to like the top 10 or are you going to research 
more things that, you know, regardless, well, I guess it depends on what type of movie you're making. If it's a genre movie, obviously you're going to hit the genre fest. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, would no, you... I mean, I mean, you have to be thoughtful about it. And I'm not saying I would only go to them. I'm just saying if I'm going to spend money, that's where I'm going to spend my money. Um, I, I wouldn't spend money trying to apply to 100 different festivals because it's just a total waste of money. I got you. I got, yeah, I mean, I... I I wouldn't say I go back and forth on festivals a lot. I really enjoy uh, the festival experience. I do feel that it does provide a lot of exposure for films that don't necessarily or will not necessarily ever make it to a theatrical type of platform or even for that matter, DV, you know, DVD or VOD. I think it's a, you know, there's definitely a lot of promise there for, you know, some sort of networking and audience building. But the only problem I have with them is that, you know, yeah, it gets expensive. And if you've already spent, you know, 30, 40 grand on your movie or more, um, you know, attacking on another 10, you know, 5 to 10 for travel and submission fees and promotions and all that other kind of stuff that goes along with going to a film festival can, you know, really bankrupt you pretty quick. Um, yeah, and, and I'm definitely not knocking festivals. This is not a problem with festivals. This is a problem with sort of managing your resources to get your movie on the screens. And um, yeah, I would, you know, I, I just don't think you can kind of just send your movie off and hope to get in. I mean, I think I've done better on Twitter just sort of getting exposure to different screenings and festivals and um, getting awareness that way. And we've done a lot of great screenings because of that. And now, that to me was infinitely more valuable than sitting around, you know, filling out applications on without a box and, and pressing send. Now, now that, that said, um, using social media, now if you're on Twitter and you're promoting a movie, like the waterhole, uh, www.thewaterhole. Sorry, Patrick J. Adams. Oh, yes, Patrick J. Adams. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, you know, um, if, if you're on Twitter, are you actively pursuing, um, you know, uh, social connections with people like programmers, festival directors, stuff like that as part of, like, your overall strategy? Or are you, do you kind of sit back and just, do you use it purely for, so people get to know you as a screenwriter. Do you use it to even, I guess, above and beyond that, do you even use it to try to find more work? Because as a screenwriter and a producer, I mean, you're definitely in demand. Oh, yeah. No, um, I had to put a new door on the front of my house because it keeps getting beaten down. I'm kind of in Jerry's uh, uh, world right now. But, no, I mean, look, I used Twitter. At first, I had no idea how I was using it. And then it became just sort of I'd meet interesting people, uh, i.e. you, um, I mean, you, well, you know, God bless you, were the first person to give us a proper nice review. And I'm, you know, I found out about you through Twitter. Um, and I met, you know, other filmmakers, festivals, you know, uh, Perry at Annapolis, uh, Pretentious Film Society, just like in conversation, not like trying to like seek out people that I thought could help me. Mm -hmm but just that I, I thought were interesting and that we had something in common and we were all involved in this world of film. And it's, you know, I, I, yeah, you meet anybody that you've met on Twitter in person, you know, like you, you know, you very rarely surprise, like, oh my God, you are creepy or you're not the person I thought. I mean, it's just been a tremendous value to me just, just in, you know, meeting kindred spirits. I, you know, I'll say that Twitter to me is like the reverse match.com. Like very, very rarely do you run into someone who doesn't quote unquote fit their profile. You know what I mean? It's, you, you listen exactly. to someone speak for so long that you do kind of get to know them as a person. And, and, and it's, I always find it funny when you end up um, referring to people by their Twitter handle versus their real name just because that's what you know Oh my God, as. I know. I get introduced as Waterhole movies so often it's like, um, that's true, but... <laughs> Yep. No, I, I, That's I, how people are like, you're that person? Oh, wow. Or, or I'm the, you're the water holer guy, that guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, no, I, it's, it, it's, it's cool. But, yeah, I mean, as, as someone in the, who in the past has used Match.com, I really should start using Twitter for dating more than that because I've never shown up to a, uh, a quote-unquote, like, Twitter date or tweet up and been disappointed. You know what I mean? I've always kind of, um, it, Twitter's always met my expectations, I guess I should say. Um, and, uh, Likewise. Yeah. So, I mean, all right. So, as far as that goes, have there been any mistakes that you feel that you guys made in, in promoting the waterhole using, you know, through your social networks? Or do you feel that, like, pretty much you've, you've done 
pretty much all there is to do with that in terms of the promotion. Like, you know, you, you've tweeted it, you've put, you know, some trailers up on, like, Facebook and stuff like that, or whatever you've done. I mean, have you, where do you feel that you guys have fallen short anywhere there? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I don't know if I'd be able to put my finger on it because, you know, I, you know, we put our trailers everywhere. We interact on Facebook a little bit. Mostly I'm aggressive on Twitter just because I've, I've seen results and, I've, and it's been such a positive experience. Um, I mean, you know, I think, you know, I guess the most amazing thing for me in terms of social media is that now that our star, Patrick J. Adams, has become like more of a big name and just got nominated for a SAG award for his role on Suits. I mean, all this crazy stuff. And, and this is one, like, one of our strategies early on was let's cast people that we think are going to be big names mm -hmm. and, and sort of like let that happen. And, you don't know when that's going to happen, so it sort of happened at the time when we we're kind of done selling the movie, um, and and so in the last few weeks we kind of did this contest and we sort of tapped into his sort of popularity. And you just look at the charts on Facebook and on um, Wildfire, the contest uh, um, application we're using. And once Patrick starts talking about it, or once you kind of get that that audience <coughs> engaged, it just comes completely blows up. I mean, it's like exponentially the numbers just go off the charts. Um, so, you know, I don't know if before that if we could have leveraged things better. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of just once we started making the, the movie, we should have definitely been thinking more about marketing and reaching out, to, you know, using social networks then, even though we didn't get you know, we in a position where we had the crowdfund, but crowdfunding obviously provides like a great sort of base, mm -hmm. you know, like these are where our fans are going to start, right? Right. Um, and so, yeah, we should have been doing that all along. So, you know, I, you know, I, I think any resource, you know, whether financial or energy or educational to kind of get yourself in a position where you're like, how am I going to find this audience um, and, and do that as early as possible uh, is in extremely valuable. Now, that said, we do have a couple of comments here in the chat room that I think you need to be aware of. One of them says, is from Handsome Party. This is Nathan should say hello to Adam and Amber, his biggest fans. Oh, hi, Adam and Amber. You are my biggest fans, and I really, really love you for that. There you go. And then the other one is from our good friend Bella Wonder, uh, and who says, uh, Wonder Russell, for those of you people out there, um, said, it should be a drinking game. Let's get water hold tonight. <laughs> Um, yes, I am happy to get waterfold, and I'd love to do it with uh, Wonder at some point. And I send out my best, uh, my best wishes and thoughts and prayers to her family. And I appreciate her tuning in tonight too. Nice. And she also she asked a question on Twitter as well. Um, how do you chat with programmers at different festivals? Seriously, I like this knowledge and ability. How do you find them? And I will uh, we'll address that a little bit later on in the show. But yeah, uh, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, literally. Even, like, one of the bigger festivals we got into was um, the Hollywood Film Festival, which was great. Mm -hmm. We got the screen in Hollywood at the Arclight Theater, and if you're not from L.A., I mean, it's the best theater, probably one of the best theaters in the world. We, just we, just, we just ran a contest with the Arclight. We gave away a signed poster by the cast of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Oh, wow, that's awesome. See, you totally uh, missed that, didn't you, you little bitch? No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know why I felt what? the need to go there. Oh, well, I didn't see I didn't even... God. Uh, hi, Jerry. <laughs> hi, Jerry. <laughs> hi. Um, but anyways, but, you know, long story short, it's like we never had any communication with the, the anyone in the festival. I mean, when we tried to, it was just like fruitless. They just like kind of berate us for like not promoting our screening enough, even though they put us at like at eleven o'clock at night. Um, so I, even like even though we were in the festival, like I had no idea how to reach out to somebody there. So right. uh, to answer um, Wonder's question, I, you know, I think you need to talk to people who have been in the festival, um, and and even then, it's like you know we knew people who had screened at Cine, um, CineQuest in San Jose mm -hmm. and like wrote good letters on our behalf. Um, I just talked to you know, Zach Forsman and I were talking about this the other night. They had like good leads for Heart of Now and some uh, key festivals, and you know it didn't even pan out. But I think if you don't even have those leads, you know it's well, like you're just the, it's the wishing well. I'm always called the wishing well. Let me tell you. Let, let me tell you guys a couple secrets. 
And okay. uh, here's, I love a, it. Here, here's here's some here's some tr- some tips and tri- tricks from uh, from your old good old friends at Film Snobbery. Um, one of them is, uh, as, and I'm sure as filmmakers, it's a completely different world for you. As someone who covers film festivals and gets approached by them for promotion and stuff like that all the time, it's a little different because they're coming to me. Um, but usually, uh, if I were in your place, what I would do is I would troll sites like LinkedIn um, because what they'll do is you, you'll find a bunch of people who in their profiles will flat out say senior programmer at Tribeca or something like that. Um, as part of their job descriptions, and those people, what you do is you find out who they are, and then you know if you don't stalk them, you know, uh, right on that social network, you stalk them on like Facebook or or um, or Twitter. That's one little trick because uh, most of them are on multiple platforms. The other one is is uh, you guys like you guys said talk to filmmakers that have been there before, but those filmmakers probably weren't involved. Or, or probably didn't get involved or speak to a lot of the programmers there either. Programmers are kind of funny because they don't always announce themselves as programmers. I have found it far more effective uh, for making contacts within film festivals to, know, to get to know the people who run the festival. Because typically the people who run the festival are the programmers. Or they're, you know, they're either involved in the programming or at the very least, they're the people who are going to get you waivers. So you'll be able to, even if you don't get in, you're at least going to be able to submit your film for cheaper or free. Um, and, and getting your, your film directly into their hands is always a good kind of uh, plan to, you know, to, to get, get in because you know that it got there. It's not relying on without a box and the postal system and all that bullshit. If you can get your hands directly into the person who runs the festival, it's like any other business meeting. If you can get to the guy who, who's, the guy or girl, I should say, who's in charge of making the decisions, that's the person you want to be in, t- in talks with. And that isn't necessarily the programmer. That is the person at the top. Um, and, and, uh, and if you can get to that person, then you're in a uh, you're in a, a, a good a good shot right there. Um, I mean, every and, time and I agree, I agree. And I'm going to add to that real quickly, if you don't mind. Sure. And this is something, and I and it's not tested, but I heard I heard a festival or a, a panel or one of these things that if you don't get into one of their their festivals, like with us, what I would do is if we, we you know when our next movie sort of ready, I will send them or we'll, we're prepping it. Um, I will send them a copy of the water hole and say, look, we, we got rejected. I don't, you know, you kind of do that sort of say, look, we, have, we, you know, we still respect each other. Like there's no bad blood, but this is a movie and we've got a new movie coming out and sort of, I, I've heard that it's a very good introduction to sort of the, the festival gatekeepers. Haven't tested it. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, looks like um, Mojave Musing Michelle in our our chat room Michelle. is is talking about how about she says how about doing market research and doing social in real life networking to get films into markets and seen by people outside of fests. You know, for the other hundreds of millions of people who may not go to film festivals that may form a part of your audience as a filmmaker throughout your career. Now that said. Um, to, to, to kind of go with that, I mean, I know a lot of filmmakers who, I mean, will do things like this, you know, our show, that, you know, they'll come on the show and they'll promote their movie, promote themselves um, as a way to, to make new friends uh, and whatnot and get people aware of their show. Then there's also, in real life, as you say, events like screening series and stuff like that, which I find that there aren't enough of. Um, it was really funny. The other day, uh, I went online, a friend of mine, another filmmaker friend of mine, emailed me and said, I have some new projects that are coming up. I want to know, are there any other, what other shows are there like yours that I can go on to to talk about my project and promote it? And I was like, fair enough, you know, um, let me think about that. And I, I could think of like four offhand. It was obviously, it was like Us, Film Courage, uh, Cutting Room Floor, Rex Sykes Movie B. And that was the only one I, that's where I stopped. I was like, I don't know any other ones off the top of my head. And like, um, and, and I, and so I went to Twitter and I got another maybe seven suggestions. I think I got like 10 or 11 in total. And uh, it really surprised me that there don't seem to be as many, um, as many shows uh, promoting independent film uh, like ours. I was really, really surprised. I thought that that was a, a travesty. And then I was talking with Jerry the other day and he was saying, or that same night rather, and he was saying that uh, when he was going to promote stuff like Chuck, and he did all his research on uh, different sites to either submit clips to or, or submit uh, for interviews or reviews or whatever, there, he said that there were, he found hundreds of sites 
that were completely dark. Like they were just shut down. Like some that were recommended by other people. It's like this hasn't had a post since January of the year before, uh, or whatever. So it was a. Uh, it, it's really kind of a, a funny thing in terms of uh, for you know it's an uphill battle for you guys uh, to to promote your stuff. Doing in real life type of events too. The only problem I find with those, whether it's a tweet up or whatever, is yes, you have to have the existing user base there to make it successful uh, to start with and to get the word of mouth out, and then. Um, also, typically, in real life stuff is going to turn into uh, an expense of some sort, um, unless you can find you know people to partner up with. But then there's still the marketing expense to it. Um, it's tough. It, it's it's tough. And, and uh, let me think here. Um, go ahead. I think. Can I interject real quickly? You know, because that point is very well taken in terms of just where are these resources? And I think Ted Hope. Like a couple years ago, I had a tweet like, where can undistributed films get reviewed? Um, obviously, you know, we, we had a, a very nice review from you and had a you know, handful of others. I think resources like us filmmakers, indie filmmakers should try and band together as is where are these sites? Because, mm. you know, uh, you know, I'd like look at some of where like Gary King was getting reviews and go, well, maybe I'll send my you know, DVD to them. Or, or another film, but it was never one location where I could go, oh, these guys review those films. Mm. And same with, like, um, interview shows like you. It's like, I don't know how I even clued into you on Twitter, but I did, and I, I kind of dug what you were doing, and that sort of, you know, snowballed in me sending you the movie and blah, 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 blah. Uh, it'd be lovely to have a resource where we could all just sort of tap into that. Um, I'm speaking hypothetically now, not, like, inspirationally, but... <laughs> Sure. No, and, and you know, Michelle also makes another point of um, you know finding other podcast sites, etc., that aren't necessarily catering to independent filmmakers and trying to interject into them. And I and she she brings up Hunter Weeks, and we've had Hunter on this show talking about when he was doing Ride to Divide. But here's the only uh, consideration to put with that: in that not every movie lends itself, especially an independent film, lends itself very well to. Um, uh, cross-promotional opportunities with, say, uh, like Hunter Weeks, they partnered with Live Strong, and, you know, you have, like, yeah, Mother's yeah. Red Dress, and I, and does I, stuff with, like, I, the United I do, Way. I want to speak to that, not interrupting you. But Please, go ahead. Um, because one thing is, like, as much as I am I'm, uh, acutely aware of audience building and, and knowing who your audience is before you make your movie, I do not think, as filmmaker, you should make that a deciding factor. And as I reflect, you know, I realize the fact that my movies are about sort of 20-somethings moaning about their problems in a bar. That's not very compelling for festival directors. There's not a big audience clamoring for that, you know, movie. Um, and if I had overthought that, the movie would never have been made. And I think, at the, at, you know, at the, at the beginning of the day, you've got to just say, I'm going to make what I want to make, and you have to leverage whatever you can off of that. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it does work, great. If you played your cards right. But I think as you know, artists, and I don't, I don't use that <coughs> word lightly, you, you, know, you, you just have to go with your heart and make what you want to make and try to make it as best as you can. So, no, I mean, it, it, for cross know, All of the considerations aside. For, for cross-promotional opportunities, off the top of my head, the only thing I... Well, off the top of my head, not the only thing I could think of, but one of the things I could think of doing would be, like, making uh, poster type of coasters, like bar coasters, and passing them out at local bars and stuff like that. But then the idea is you're spending money on that, obviously, in time, because you have to get them produced. But, you know, what is... And I guess a lot... Where a lot of the questions come up here is... What, where, where's the return on investment, either in eyeballs or in dollars? And, and at the end of the day, you want it to be dollars. Um, eyeballs are great if you are yeah, using... Yeah, I want both. But. Yeah, I mean, I, eyeballs are great if you're using whatever project you're working on as a stepping stone to the next part. But it goes along with analyzing what your career goals are and what your goals for the movie are and your expectations. So... What you know, if if you say, okay, we're gonna print out a th you know print up a, a thousand um, bar coasters and we're gonna pass them out at local bars, and then at like say two months later, uh, what we'll do is we'll hold a uh, or a month later we'll hold a screening at one of those bars. Um, you know that we know that you know they've gone through them or people have you know possibly been talking about it or whatever. So you have a plan there, but you know at the end of the day, who's buying the tickets for it and who how many people? Uh, responded to that marketing effort, that campaign. Because at the end yeah, of the day, it is a campaign. 
Go ahead. I mean, that's the thing with this is I always initially thought, well, there's bar crowd. This is a bar movie. And then you think about, like, after sort of presenting it that way, you think about, like, who really hangs out in bars and drinks a lot. Not a lot. I mean, there are a lot of filmmakers do, but not a lot of film fans necessarily. You know what I mean? So, like, I would, most people would rather hang out in the bars and drink than go see, like, sort of a, a weighty relationship movie that happens to take place in a bar. So that's... What, I think where one of my sort of initial thoughts sort of backfired, because when we tried to do that, when we did screenings in Reno and whatnot, screenings in downtown LA, approaching it that way just did not pay off. And you know, there's probably different factors for that, but um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, that, it's definitely there's no science to this. It's, it's marketing. If, right. if people could figure out how to market movies perfectly, the movie studios would never have a bomb, you know. Yeah, and, and it's the, I guess the the big pro, and not only that. I mean, you're uh, you know, you're you're marketing at such a low budget level. Now I say you being independent filmmakers, and hell, even my sure. even myself, you know, is someone who works kind of yeah. on the fringe. Um, yeah, it, it's you're they're working with hundreds of millions of dollars. You're working with hundreds of dollars if you're lucky. <laughs> you know what I mean? So exactly. it's, yeah. it's you know, you're, the, those cards are already stacked against you. Um, definitely thinking locally and, and acting locally is definitely a, a great um, chance to be able to, to build that audience uh, and then work your way out. But the problem is, is that um, it can take a long time. And, yes, you have to have a great product to go along with that. And unfor one of the unfortunate parts of uh, doing what I do is that there is, I'd say, there's a very high percentage of movies that I look at and I will just go, this is going nowhere. Like, you know, there's usually a redeeming quality somewhere, whether it's the writing or the acting or whatever, but there are some of these movies, a lot of these movies, I'll say even that, you know, I go, I'm like, this isn't even going on VOD. This isn't going anywhere. And, you, so, and I'll tell you what, because jumping back a little, a lot of those movies get into Sundance and South by Southwest. And I'm not saying that to be snarky. I mean, that's just, that's the reality. I mean, that's... Yeah. Well, South by is uh, always catered to a you know, a, uh, and, and I think we were saying it. Someone said it late, uh, further up in the chat room earlier. You know, South by Southwest does tend to cater to a more mumblecore audience, a more DIY audience, um, not necessarily. And, and unless you're, unless you are screening at you know, like a prime time. Um, or you know somebody, uh, because if you're screening at a prime time, you're not, uh, you know, like opening night movie, closing night movie. They'll pick. Uh, first of all, they'll pick mainstream movies to screen, and second of all, they'll pick very high, uh, high quality. I don't want to use the word quality, but uh, high production value. Um, Budget. High put. I guess that's a, a thing too. High budgeted uh, movies to show as well, and, and I. I understand that, but um, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with it. I mean, we've. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm totally cool with all that, but like, yeah. quality consistency is like, if, if there was quality along all that lines, I'd be fine. But it, there, there isn't. And that, again, quality subjective. But there's a lot of movies that just go there and die because they're just not that good. It's like, well, why were they programmed? But I mean, we could overtake this for for days. Oh, of course. Um, At the end of the day, you have to. I mean, but, go ahead. But um, I know we are, uh, I don't want to eat up all your time and you have questions to get to. So I was thinking, do you want to do a DVD giveaway now or? I, I say you know, we should, I, totally... I say we should do a DVD giveaway. So, we'll, so let's. It's not let's... all about it. I'm going to sign this DVD. And you know what I noticed uh, that's hilarious to me is that at the time of this DVD was printed, the show that Patrick was in, or is in, called Suits, is actually listed as a legal mind on here before they actually changed the, the, the title before it got released. Which nice. to me is amusing that I never noticed that before. All right, so if you so guys... a collector's item. Collector's item, and if you guys out there want your very own copy of The Waterhole signed by our guest tonight, Nathan Cole, uh, Jerry, tell them how they can win. I am going to post something in the chat and the very first person to put it up on Twitter and tweet it out will win the DVD. So I'm going to put it right now in the chat. Nice. And it says, watching at Film Snobbery Live and at Waterhole Movie will not stop name dropping Patrick J. Adams. Visit FilmSnobberyLive.com to see why. And change the monkey to the HTTP. <laughs> so like, yeah, that 
don't know why that happened. Our damn chat room. But but the funny part <laughs> is is that the uh, the the link still works. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I do not understand that, but whatever. Get rid of the monkey and then put it. See now you can't just copy and paste. You actually have to type. Exactly. See, there we go. Um, work. So that's it. So and and uh, the first part, Jerry's going to kind of uh, sit on that and make sure that that gets taken care of the way it needs to. And uh, the winner's going to win a uh, copy, signed copy of uh, the Waterhole movie uh, by the uh, screenwriter and producer of the movie, uh, Nathan Cole. And, oh my God, they're flowing in. Uh, are, are they? Are they really? <laughs> see, if if we don't see a lot of them, what's going to happen is is it's because they've all, everyone's already bought it on Amazon. That's the thing. So oh, I can tell you from my sales number that that's not the case. <laughs> and and actually, let's talk a little bit about that. So where right now, let's talk about where the water hole is available, and let's talk about real quick because uh, I I know that you probably want to get going soon. Uh, let's talk real quick about your any mistakes that you feel you would have made in your distribution strategy. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is sort of my new, obviously, hot button point in my own debate that I have in my mind, which is better for my wife because she doesn't have to listen to it. <laughs> um, and, and, you, know, we, we, you know, at some point after we sort of made all these sort of initial, as, as we're calling them mistakes, but, you know, maybe you wouldn't call them that, um, learning experiences, we were like, let's just go full in. So we were like, we have to get a sales rep, and we got a sales rep, and we paid for it. And which became fashionable for them a few years ago when the market dropped out of the indie film business. So, you know, essentially, essentially we're spending more money to hopefully get our, our, our film distributed. Um, you know, hear the same things, no stars, drama, you know, not a horror. Uh, and and there was just, there's just not an, a lot of offers. And so kind of midway through this process, I started prepping my, my business partner, Daniel, but you know, we're going to have to self-distribute this. And, you know, we're not going to get an offer. Um, everything I was reading in the trades or anywhere is like just people aren't buying these movies. And we started doing the research and reading, you know, think outside the box office. And, and you know, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of compelling uh, um, reasons why you should self-distribute. And so I, was, so I thought it was a, a, a foregone conclusion. And then we end up getting a deal through our current distributor, uh, Vanguard. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was like, that was the deal. Uh, and it was a revenue share deal, no expenses. And and how long know, how long do they own the movie for? Pardon? How long do they Seven own posts. the Seven years. That's not bad. Not bad. Um, you know, we, we were, like, trying to get, like, so that we would own digital, which I really wish we had been able to convince them of. But, you know, the, you know, the, the thing was, it's like, look, the, our rationalization was now we can say our films picked up by a distributor. And, and, and I actually spoke with uh, uh, Zach Forsman, you know, a few months ago, and, and he said, you know, he was talking about it. He was like, that, that's valuable. That carries value. And I was like, yeah, good. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And I, and I still believe that, but, mm -hmm. you know, as I look at sort of, and, and backing up yet again, you know, when I sat down with the distributor, I'm like, well, what about Netflix, what about this, what about that? And uh, they were very like, look, don't get your hopes up. We will try this, we'll try that, um, but we can't promise you anything. Do you uh, feel that there's so, anything you know, that your distributor did that you couldn't do yourself? Absolutely not. I mean, we got one nice review from somebody who's, found the movie in a video rental store in Canada that I could not have done. And quite frankly, that's almost enough for me. You know what I mean? That's like <coughs> almost en enough reason for me to say, great, you know, I'm glad we're doing this. But you know, at the end of the day, no. I mean, I'd rather have gone through, you know, Stripper and done all my, you know, BOD myself. I mean, right now they're just doing basically a create space Amazon DVD print on demand, which pretty much anyone could do. So, yeah. 
Uh, which actually uh, reminds me, I mean, Jerry, uh, if you want to just talk, speak to it briefly, I mean, you had an idea with uh, Stuck Like Chuck before you decided to put it out there for free uh, as briefly as it was. Um, what was your, you had a digital kind of VOD kind of hybrid distribution model you wanted to test out. What was that again? It, it, it was like Distriber with uh, some, uh, some other kind of similar uh, things. I don't even remember. I have it written down somewhere. But uh, yeah, it was like Distriber. Mixed in with, um, it wasn't Amazon's uh, DVD on demand. But it, was, it was actually it was Amazon's video, uh, DVD on demand, as well as Film Baby, for their distribution to stores by doing their extended program, where you don't get paid like for like three months more than usual. But they actually <coughs> sort of take a chance on you because they're not losing any money. Like the stores don't have to pay for the movies up front, so you get actually in like more like video rental stores and stuff. But uh, yeah, that was like a whole big plan. And then I decided I'm releasing it for free instead. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be bothered with going to all these different companies. Yeah, there was more to it than that. Though. There was. But uh, anyway, so uh, thank thank you for that uh, that that uh, bit of, of useless commentary, Jerry. Yeah, I wish I knew I, I knew I was going to bring that up. I would have had the actual plan laid out because it was actually much more elegant than what I just rattled. Well, and, and I agree, which is why I brought it up because it really did cover uh, pretty well and for a fairly low cost, considering you know what they were he was doing. Uh, it, it covered uh, you know VOD, yeah, I think DVD. It came out to like it was going to cost like two thousand dollars, but you'd be on. Tons of different platforms, and it, but you'd be using four different services, but you still own the rights, and none of them were uh, exclusive. So it worked out that you could do it with all these different companies. Uh, maybe I'll post a blog about that or something. I'll, I'll look for my old notes on it. There you go. Wait, that so was, I was not what, was, what, 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 how did it fall apart, or why were you not compelled? Uh, there was just a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, eventually I decided that I'd rather people just watch the film free and get the film out there than continue promoting it and trying to sell it to, go, going through all these different outlets and trying to sell it in different ways. Well, because uh, also Jerry, Jerry was trying to promote a movie that was already more than three years old. You know what I mean? And so it's, it became really uh, hard to, to get, keep people interested. And another part of it was I knew that if I had gotten this film out there and people actually got to watch stuff like Chuck, that would bode better for stuff like Chuck too. Like exactly. it would actually lead to more interest in that. And clearly that did not happen. <laughs> clearly not. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, um, no, but and that's that's an interesting um, for, for you know. Um, Interesting uh, commentary as far as your distributor and stuff like that, and, and how things have worked so far. Um, have you guys? Uh, here's a, a very, can, I guess, candid question, but um, have you guys broken even on your movie yet? Not even close. Okay. Like, nowhere even near close. Is like, is, is anyone it was upset by that? Significantly higher than than probably most. Uh, like it's not. It was above the micro indie budget. Okay. And, 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 uh, oh, yeah, no. I'm sorry, what? No, no, I was trying, I was, I, I blanked out on the next question I was going to ask, so I literally just sat there with a dumb look on my face for a second, which is horrible when I'm on camera. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm sad I'm not watching it. That's okay. Um, that's okay. You'll get to see it in, uh, in, in the archive once it's, uh, once it's up, uh, which should only be in a couple days. But I think that, you know, we've uh, we probably, uh, if everyone hasn't already forgotten it, uh, we've probably got a winner by now for the DVD, the signed DVD of The Waterhole, signed by Nathan Cole. Uh, Jerry, do you want to announce the winner? By one second, one Matt second. Jones won. Who's Matt Jones? Matt Jones is... 271 film. Two se yeah, 271 films. At 271 films. I don't know who Matt Jones is, but uh, I'm following him now, and he's following me. So thanks, Matt Jones. And yeah, he show yourself in the chat room. Yes, because obviously you're watching. So uh, unless you were just uh, <laughs> unless you were just uh, uh, tweeting stuff that other people were tweeting out randomly. But then he wouldn't have won because other people would have beat him. Ah, good call. Good call. Um, so congrats, Matt whoever you are. So if you're lurking in the, the chat room, um, 
you should make yourself known. Uh, if you are just watching, um, you have to go ahead and figure out some way of getting your information to us. Um, if you like, you can email me over at uh, uh, admin at filmsnobbery.com. Oh, excuse me. Admin at filmsnobbery.com, and uh, we'll need your uh, your deets, your name, address, phone number, the whole nine, and so we can get that out to you, and I'll forward it on to Nathan. And um, that's it. So uh, I just like to say that Zach Forsman and Wonder Russell were the second place. They they were the ones. You don't get anything though. Sorry, but they were all fine. Second, but they both Wonder the same already time has a copy awesome. of the movie. Well, yeah, you know, but she's already watched that copy. Yeah. Exactly. You need to. You need another copy. She needs to get another copy so she can watch it again. That's how it works. Yeah, she needs a fresh copy. So <laughs> I don't know. There's no, absolutely no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we got nothing. Uh, I can arrange that though, because there really is a deep need. By the way, we. we I, I want a commercial where I, I'm. I'm swimming in a sea of DVDs, of independent film DVDs. <laughs> you should have done that before you sold all your DVDs. I know, right? Yeah, uh, I, I guarantee you. Once you get out to LA, we can make that happen. Lovely, and, uh, <laughs> and by we, I mean other people that I will help make that happen. Right? <laughs> we are, uh, by, and we are everything. By the way, for this trip, everything Nick must go. So I am selling my uh, my Canon, my uh, my ca my camera. I'm selling um, uh, a green screen behind me. I'm doing a whole. I got a lot of stuff. So. Yay, we're selling things. <laughs> I, uh, can I buy it all and make you still bring it out here for me? <laughs> you can buy it all, and I will br personally deliver it to you uh, as long as you're in the L.A. area. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to consider this, and then when I get here, I'm like, not what I expected. I'm not paying. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what would happen. Um, <laughs> no, because Nathan wants to just recreate Film Snobbery Live for his own personal... Uh, in his own house, personal. He'll have me on every still Thursday night, and he'll be like, "Do the show." But there will actually be a waterhole poster in the background. <laughs> that that is the whole background. It's on a green screen, so uh, I'm doing the show with nothing but a enlarged waterhole poster behind me. And I see your kid running in front of the camera, stuff like that. So <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm loving all of it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. So now let me ask you, if 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 you were doing the Waterhole movie again now, if you were doing it right now, uh, starting from scratch, would you have crowdfunded it? Um, oh, I don't know. I, I, like, my easy answer is no. No way. Um, and pour quoi, si vous play. Why? Because that is a lot of work, and <laughs> I would rather get the money um, other ways. But I mean, like, I, look, I mean, crowdfunding is such a loaded subject with me, and I've, I've sort of gone back and forth on this. And and I, 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 the bottom line is, like, getting money to make a movie is such an incredibly difficult, like, you know, clawing your way out of the loom sort of process. That however you can do it, like, God bless you, do it, make it work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like I see so many crowdfunding projects that are, you know, just they're so desperate and <laughs> and, My, and mine's going like to be very desperate <laughs> no I feel like anyone who didn't give to stuff like Chuck 2 is an asshole and like what, what, who wants to live in a world like that I'm going to use that quote just so you know <laughs> what? Jerry said he's going to use that quote just so you know <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, I, the thing uh, the thing that you filmmakers road. have ahead of me though is that you guys at least at the end of the day have a product. You know what I mean? Like for me, yes, we have the show, we have you know other stuff, but it's not like people are paying for reviews. You know, it's not like people are paying for you know. Um, we don't really have a lot of swag per se. Like uh, one of the perks that we're going to have on the the new campaign is yes, you'll be able to get a film snobbery shirt. But you've got to donate 50 bucks, you know, because it's going to cost us money to get and, and ship the shirt. So we have I'll to... I'll give you 25 for it. Yeah, but that's not going to work for me. You know what I mean? Like, I have to make... Yeah, no, no. Yeah, you have to make a significant profit. And then, you know, I, the, the only other thing that I... 
Um, the only one, uh, and the audience that's here, well, I think uh, we'll get it. I was going to save it for kind of a surprise, but I think that the audience here will really get the, uh, the reference. Um, one of the perks we're going to do, it's a bit expensive. I think I put it at like 750 bucks, but um, it's called A Month Without Rent. And it's literally, once I get an apartment in L.A., if you're a filmmaker who's also trying to struggle to make it out to L.A., you can come and live with me for a month. And, and I, I will put you up on my couch or wherever, and, and you know, as you get your feet under, under you, you know, to, to kind of start your career out there, I will be there to, you know, to, 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 to you can use my place. You know what I mean? So that's, you know, I, to me, that's something that I think that not a lot of people would offer and, and that, uh, you know, I'm, yes, it's a bit pricey, but it's basically like you're prepaying for your spot because, you know, 750 that's a month's rent anywhere in California, I'm guessing, for the most part. Um, um, you realize that we have warm weather and beaches here, right? Because uh, some people would just sleep on a beach. That's my plan. Not... <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Uh, oh, by the way, and uh, uh, Gary King said, side topic, is that a real plant behind you on your picture, or is that a gobo? That's a real Southern California palm, Gary, and you would know that if uh, you weren't in some apartment in Queens, is it? I'm just kidding. I have nothing against Gary being in the East Coast, except for he's too far away from me. That is true. I will miss. I will miss being driving distance from New York. I think that will be one of my the the biggest things that I miss. Because I mean, I'll be honest. Boston doesn't have, and I'm not even in Boston. I'm like an hour, hour and a half outside of Boston. Um, doesn't really have the hugest indie community. You know, if I really want to feel like I'm surrounded by that those type of creative people, I go to New York. Um, I'm really looking forward to having that feeling again when I go to LA because. That is something that I really feed off of, and it motivates me quite a bit. Um, kind of like every time I go to a film festival, I always have that kind of afterglow of a film festival, even if it's kind of a shitty one, um, because I, I get to just be surrounded by filmmakers, and it kind of reminds me why I do what I do. So, right, Look, that is a beautiful feeling, and we are very much looking forward to having you out here, and uh, I will try and find a decent barbecue place that we can uh, have a beer and some barbecue at. Oh, beer and barbecue. I, I, I love me some barbecue, but you know that. We've, we've gotten barbecue. Exactly. See, I'm referencing things that have happened between us. Yes, yes. To establish further connection. <clears throat> exactly. So, um, that, that said, is there, what are you working on next? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, again, a lot of energy still to sort of uh, getting the, the water hole out there, which is ridiculous because it's been forever. But we have two scripts, two scripts that I'm fairly comfortable with, and one's another independent drama, which sort of we're scared by because it's like, well, what do you do with it unless you, you know, fit all these parameters we, we've already discussed. And then another is a, a supernatural thriller, which I'm scared by because just to say that seems like, I'm making one of those movies to try and get picked up by Lionsgate and star like some, you know, washed up B actor. So, <laughs> you know, we're talking to some investors and get this, you know, some feedback on the scripts. And I mean, I think if we do another independent sort of character driven drama, I think we could do it for cheaper and we have a lot more resources and friends and access to, you know, great actors now. Um, and so it's kind of compelling to do that. It's something I would definitely direct. Um, but I think, you know, it's, you know, I've been having this discussion a lot with other filmmakers. It's like, well, how do you make a living on this? Because, you know, I don't want to work my day job anymore. And I want to be able to, you know, have my kid to be clothed and not like yep. in the streets uh, looking like uh, uh, an urchin and begging for food. So, so you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, no, and, and I, you know, I, I completely understand. I mean, this is what I do for a job. I mean, I don't have a day job, but I am definitely worried of, like, <clears throat> you know, going outside of the norm and, and uh, jeopardizing, you know, those things like, you know, if you're, especially if you're married with a kid, you can't just quit your day job. you got to have, you know, you got to earn. Uh, for me, it's a little different um, because I don't have that uh, responsibility. Um, for me, it's just, you know, if I want to move, i got to go. But obviously, I have to be in a place and, and, and with resources that allow me to continue to do this for a living. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and how, do you, how do you sustain? I don't know. I was hoping you were going to tell me during this interview. 
because I, I got to tell you. Suffering. I mean, Lots of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had this roof over my head in a, you know, very, like, in a, in a house anywhere else in the world that would be like a mansion compared to, you know, pricing in L.A. But, you know, so I, I can't complain, but it's definitely a lot of work and, you know, not having enough time to do the things you want to do, ideally, but... Sure. No, I can't I complain. But, uh, well, that, that it's good to hear that you've got more going on after, you know, Waterhole. One of the, the biggest things that... I love about doing this job is is talking to people like yourself who you know you've made one movie and now you're gonna make another you know same thing with like Zach and Gary and, and all these other people that we've we've met over the years um, except for Jerry and uh, you know who are are are, 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 are making are making their second film um, no you know Jerry is actually I, I am very very proud of, and will always be very very proud of Jerry because you know even when you know sh he got the shit kicked out of him pretty heavily on that crowdfunding campaign and all that he didn't give up he wrote two more scripts he just optioned one of them and you know he's got the other one out there now waiting for people to to, to, to buy up and uh, you know even if he's not directing the movie he understands that his strength is in writing and he'll sell a movie and then take that money and go you know he'll go and make whatever yeah, he wants no. so he's got a good plan and I respect for I, I, I have nothing but respect for Jerry and I've always said that it's gonna be very sad when he's not uh, a part of the show proper anymore once I go out to LA but uh, you know fuck him um, so, you know, really, you know he, Jerry needs to be in LA, and I've told him this repeatedly, and he ignores my advice. But uh, I'm waiting for Nick to get settled, and then I'm going to crash on his couch. <laughs> Jerry's going to use me. Yeah, exactly. No, Jerry, Jerry's going to use me. That's what's going to happen. Um. <laughs> I, I'll do what I do when I when I forget a uh, someone's birthday or something. That I'll. Uh, Nick, instead of rent this month, I'm just going to name a character after you. Oh, they, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, you're going to be like my, the Kramer to my Seinfeld. That's really what you're going to be. Like, you just kind of, you walk in and you, you just take stuff out of the fridge and stuff like that. And you cook up harebrained schemes for me to be a part of. Um, and, and Mojave, uh, uh, Michelle says, right. she says, why can't he be part of the show proper when you're in L.A.? Oh, because I have another co-host coming on. And uh, you guys will actually be able to talk to her next week. Uh, she's going to come and in. And her name's Tori Spelling. No, no. All right. No. A stab in the dark. That, that was good, good call. No, uh, she is a, a very talented actress by the name of uh, Leah Savoli. And um, she's, uh, she's done some web series work. Um, she's also been on Robot Chicken. She's been on uh, uh, Deadwood. Um, she's uh, very nice. And wow, I'm, she's infinitely better than Tori Spelling, then. Infinitely better than Tori Spelling, yes, and uh, she's uh, she's yeah she's she's totally cool. Um, she's actually a part of uh, the project Kickstarter project going on right now called Jedi Camp that our, our friend here in the oh, uh, uh, Bill, Bill doing it. yeah Bill a first glance film yeah he's he's a you know doing that and uh, she's a part of it as well and um, so people should donate to that because they only got like eleven or ten days left so just give them money but save money for when I do my project. Because uh, that's coming up March 1st, so uh, whoever the first person is to donate, I don't know, I'll thank them. I don't really have a plan yet, but um, <laughs> much like my California plan in general, there is no plan. The plan is that there is no plan, and the plan is going according to plan. So that is what's going on. So, uh, Nathan, I want to thank you for, for, for stopping by. Was there anything else that we definitely want, that you specifically wanted to cover that we didn't get a chance to talk about? No, nope, I feel like we beat it all to death. Beautifully. I, I no, love it. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you for all the support you've given to AR Movie and any independent film uh, makers and, and the scene and all the work you do, and I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm looking forward to having you in Los Angeles, and I will crash whatever set you do <laughs> broadcast from. So. Nice. Well, thank you, and, and I, I do appreciate it, uh, but just remember that I don't have a job unless you, you guys are doing your jobs and making these movies. So I'm the one who's grateful for you guys giving me the opportunity uh, via being creative uh, to, to be able to do something cool that isn't like you know, washing dishes in a diner or something like that, or working in a cubicle. So I, uh, I, I am infinitely grateful to you guys all out there as well, not just saying that to Nathan, but to everyone who's watching. So uh, cool beans. Thank you All very right. much. Good night. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, you will, sir. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that was our good friend, Nathan Cole. We're going to go ahead uh, and we're going to, um, we're just going to cut to a, a quick uh, little commercial for our friends over at Indie Picks Unlimited. Indie Picks Unlimited. Oh.
Hello, I, I just heard myself. And when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we have some questions that we did on like a Twitter Q&A that we did recently. We're just going to kind of talk a little bit about some uh, cross-marketing and, and some differences between marketing via uh, Twitter and Facebook. And we're also going to take your questions. So we'll be right back. Pixel Unlimited, good stuff. Uh, if you don't subscribe to them, you should because they're kind of cool. Um, <coughs> I, I like them. <laughs> IndiePixUnlimited.com, uh, or you can get to them, I think, probably also from IndiePix.com. But anyways, um, <laughs> so we, we were talking with some people on, uh, on Twitter, and uh, we were getting a lot of questions about uh, social media marketing and... Um, we wanted to kind of address some of that. Now, the questions we had, uh, it was specifically regarding like Twitter and Facebook, what's the best way to, to kind of market yourself, your film, your production company, whatever, on, on Twitter and Facebook, and is there a difference in how you would do it? Well, for me, I would say the big difference is uh, a visual difference. Um, when you go ahead and you post things to Facebook, typically, you know, movie, especially like movie clips and pictures and stuff like that, um, you can see it right on the wall. There's no extra clicking. With you know Twitter, you usually have to upload something you know via something and then either link it or you know attach it via like a TwitPic or something like that. So I mean, there's obvious things like that giving people you know the the extra click that they'll have to do to do something. Um, but honestly, I don't really feel that like one works better than the other. Uh, another necessarily, I will say that stop people out there creating fucking groups. Because groups keep getting shut down because Facebook is trying to move away from groups. They want pages. So uh, the next time you have a production, production company, whatever the fuck you're doing, please create a page for your group, not a, uh, a page for your production, not a group. Um, that said, uh, <laughs> um, we are... Uh, well, you know the big problem with pages? What is, is the big problem with pages, Jerry? You can't... You can't mass message everyone that likes your page, but groups, you can mass message everyone that is in your group. That's why so many people still join groups, but groups suck. Yeah, I, I don't like groups, but that's the only thing that they should bring over from groups to pages. And then no one will, will create groups anymore, I oh, think. I agree, but and then also on top of it, like I said, I mean, Facebook is actively closing groups down systematically, regardless of activity, and, and I think they're doing, obviously, the lowest uh, numbered groups, like the people have the lowest num amount of members. Uh, they're, they're shutting those down f first, but uh, it, it's going to go away, and you're going to lose all the people that you have built up in that group, because when you do a page, it doesn't, you can't convert those people over, so you're going to have to go and hunt for them all over again and make sure that they rejoin, so when you do it, do it as a page, plus um, in terms of uh, search results, in terms of even just the URL, rather than having a group URL for this, which is, you know, for Facebook, which is typically a lot longer, from what I understand, um, like for us, our page or, or you know fan page whatever you want to call it our business page even for uh, Facebook is facebook.com slash film snobbery why wouldn't you want something that fucking simple so uh, consider that next time um, <clears throat> just saying so uh, I know let's, I'm just kind of checking out I like the Jack Forsman's advice what is that what works better than both Facebook and Twitter for getting a bunch of people to see your movie casting stars right right uh, let's see, uh, and all other channels that predate the shiny world of social media marketing experts that are part of them. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of the whole social media marketing expert. I don't ever claim to be. Um, you know, all I know is, uh, I know, I know tech 
That is what I know. That doesn't make me a social media marketing expert, doesn't necessarily make me any type of marketing expert, uh, but I do know tech. And I will tell you right now that, um, th that you can very easily Cross promote across and use them. Uh, what you know, Twitter, Facebook, so that to complement each other. Like we we tend to run a lot of contests for people that are watching the show on Twitter. Why? Because we found that you know using doing it on Facebook. Not everyone necessarily follows us on Facebook, but you know most people follow us on Twitter. So you know we'll run contests and stuff like that on Twitter. But if we're doing announcements and events, things that we need physical people to interact with. Um, or people to physically interact with, whether it's screenings or crowdfunding campaigns and stuff like that, we really get a lot better response on Facebook. Um, but, you know, obviously we cross post between the two. Um, we have our site set up so that when we do post an article or we quote post a review, um, it posts to both, um, you know, using different tools. I measure my social media analytics on both sites just to make sure that, you know, they're both, uh, there is growth um, on both. And uh, we have found that Twitter has been a certainly a, a, a more um, a more uh, uh, it's been better for us uh, but you know Facebook we still use for for a lot of different things I mean Facebook is also good too because there are you know a lot of integrated apps that you can use with uh, Facebook as well whether it's um, put you know like uh, MailChimp has you know uh, you can embed your um, uh, what do you call it? Your newsletters or or mailing list sign up uh, sheet on there. Um, you know the different tabs and stuff like that you can have. Now they even have it so you can customize full on like welcome screens for people. And I notice a lot of people are doing that for movies and stuff like that, uh, making interactive kind of uh, almost websites that like when you go to their Facebook page, that's the first thing you see is like this interactive kind of you know website clone or um, stuff like that. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see who in the what and the how is going on here. Uh, da, 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 Just adding on to that, yes. I noticed that when I was doing my horribly unsuccessful crowdfunding campaign, the people that I did get to contribute or help out with the campaign mostly came from Twitter. There you go. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, it, it's well, Twitter. I find you get a more immediate response from. Um, I find that. Uh, Facebook is good if like I'll go on Facebook all day because I you know in, in different parts of the day because I know that I can kind of go back through my timeline and I can kind of see uh, what's gone on at different parts of the day you really can't do that with Twitter Twitter is more of like what happened in the past five minutes unless it's trending five seconds <laughs> yeah, yeah depending on what your Twitter feed looks the like more mine. followers you get like it gets to the point where it's like you have to refresh it every like 10 seconds <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, I know. I, I literally, I mean, like the other night, I was on Twitter for most of the night, and I literally just kept hitting, like, refresh, and I'd have another 30, you know, tweets that I'd have to read through, you know. Um, I've noticed that on, like, Twitter is kind of like, are you just bumping into a friend and quick chat? And then usually if you want to, like, talk more or whatever, you move over to Facebook. Like, that's what it seems to happen. Like, I, I meet people on Twitter, and then I friend them on Facebook, <coughs> and then... That's when we have conversations in the chat room, right. and like I get to know them by checking out well, like their info and stuff, and Facebook stalking them. And, and plus so the. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, and plus they're they're uh, you know when, you know that the, you have the ability to also um, not only are you looking at their you know their profile and stuff like that, but you they have a kind of email and instant messaging capability too that and is that is unlimited that uh, Twitter doesn't have. I mean, Twitter has direct messages, but it, they're still limited by the 140 characters. Yeah. So, are you uh, now uh, Zach and and you even brought up uh, uh, briefly Pinterest? Have you started using that? No. I started using it as I a way to. I was like, you're asking Zach, and then I'm like, oh no, you must be asking me. There's no one else. Yeah, but um, so are you using? You're not using Pinterest at all. Are you? Have you? Yeah, I have not even signed up. For okay, it. I signed up for it because I wanted to get an idea of what was what was up with it. And you know, yes, we've gotten uh, a decent amount of uh, followers to start with on it and stuff like that. We're nowhere near like a power user level or anything like that. But I, I find it interesting, but I find it uh, frustrating at the same time. Um, I'm trying to find the. <sighs> I'm trying to find the return on investment aspect of it. Not only for, what exactly for, the, is the point of that site? The point is, is that you recommend a bunch of stuff. You put them up on bulletin board. It's like it's literally like a college bulletin board. This is something you can relate to. You go to a college bulletin board and you see a bunch of people, uh, a bunch of things Those that don't people really exist anymore. are. It's not in my college, but okay. Well, shut the fuck up and 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 play along. God damn okay. you. <laughs> 
You're, you are really like the fucking Scott Mosier of the show where you're like I'm Kevin Smith and I'm trying to paint like a word fucking picture and you're like well it's nothing like that Nick and I'm like fucking shut up play along um, alright so here's the deal so it's like a college bu bulletin board where like you have a bunch of things that people are putting up there whether it's hey check out my band check out this this is another cool thing an advertisement for this a picture of this uh, or whatever and that's basically what it is it's, it's you creating an online bulletin board that is full of sites uh, pictures, you know, they don't really do videos, but really, it's, you know, sites and stuff like that, uh, things that interest you or things that you want other people to look at. Um, I do see a marketing, uh, uh, I, I definitely see marketing potential for it, but I don't really see... Uh, it doesn't seem all that different from, like, a Tumblr. It, it, I, I, yeah, I mean, or, or like those um, uh, paperly type of things yeah, that you see. I hate those. I, you know, I don't necessarily hate them when they're well done. You know, the, most I, of the time though, it's like I, I get it. It's like you, you know, you, uh, this week's daily is out, and or th today's daily is out, and it has like a link, and I click on it because it's like sent to me. And then like I scroll through like five pages, and I find like a tweet I did where I retweeted someone, and it's not even my tweet, and it's like connecting me to it. And I'm like, what the hell is? This? Like, I went through all this, I thought someone was talking about me, or, like, they, they were promoting my stuff. I'm like, nope, not yeah. at all. And, and, you know, Michelle mentioned something in the, the chat room, maybe not necessarily uh, in, in regards to Pinterest, but she said something about you have to engage in two-way dialogue, not just broadcast. And that is, I think, where the downfall with Pinterest and... Um, and uh, uh, help me out here, those paperly things is where, yes, you are... Uh, you, whether you're, you, you're collecting things from other people, and yeah, like on Pinterest you can repin things, which I guess is the equivalent of a retweet. Um, or sharing. Or sharing, yeah. But there's no, there's no dialogue in that kind of social, uh, there's no conversation, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and Pinterest is very, very limited to what you see on the front page. You know, unless you're stocking your own stuff, which, you know, you can look at your own boards and you can look at other <coughs> specific people's boards, but you can't, you know, when you look at the front page of Pinterest, um, it's just a mashup of, of shit that is going to be gone in the next five minutes. You know, it's going to be completely changed. So, I, yeah, I, I um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a fad. It's a fad. Yeah. Well, it's the well, it, the I, thing about Pinterest on, that I don't know if you know is Pinterest is the Pinterest is the largest and fastest, uh, or I should say, largest is the fastest growing uh, uh, website in the up, world. It's been around since two thousand seven. What Pinterest? Yeah. Well, supposedly what every what what the the uh, all the the tech. It just uh, all of a sudden it blew up now, but it's actually been beta testing since two thousand seven. Well, there's been. Like thousands of users using it, and like then it opened up like a year after that, and then all of a sudden it just blew up earlier this year. Which I don't know. I, I are, you, are you on? I, I asked you before. I don't think you heard Google Plus. Are you still using that? Uh, I'm on it. I'll occasionally use it, uh, but honestly, like, not. Yeah. I mean, I've stopped like accumulating friends in my circles and shit like that. I mean, I still get people that that put me on theirs all the time, but I, I just I, I haven't really done anything with it because I don't see the uh, return on investment in terms of time and 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 uh, and interest. Um, it, but I, you know, we do have it's a. Kind of, it's like the mating of Twitter and Facebook, kind of like it's like. There's really not that much different, except like it, it's kind of all in one place. But I still haven't done like a Hangout or anything. Because when I've tried to do it, my computer's too outdated to use Google Hangouts. So I can't do Google Hangouts with anybody. And that's like the main reason why people still are using Google Plus, I've heard. Like the Muppets commercial and everything. So, yeah. yeah. I, I can't comment on Google Hangouts. I, I, honestly, I wanted to try using Google Hangouts here on this show, like where... Like, say, Jerry, you weren't necessarily, like, the co-host, you know what I mean? But instead, I have six other people or whatever, how many people you can add to it, like, five or ten other people that I can go to to get commentary from at any given time during the show where they're seeing the show filmed live while they're on the Hangout, but we can literally go to them for commentary. I always thought that that would have been a cool feature like to that have. that can be our audience. <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Like, that's the studio audience well, I've aspect. actually, i wanted to do, because I heard, like, some filmmakers are trying to do it, or, like, they've been putting short films. I wanted to do, like, a screening of Stuck Like Chuck on Google Hangouts, where just, like, anyone could, like, chime, like, 
basically you would have had to see the film first, but like an open commentary while the film is playing. Because we have, I mean, especially with like either my laptop here or like my tablet or whatever, we have the ability to, to do that. And I've always wanted to try it out, but like it's just never been a good time. And we've never, we obviously we'd have to test it. You know, I don't want to do it like on a show, like as the test. But uh, but you know, maybe when we go to LA, maybe that'd be something fun to do, or maybe you know, um, even just uh, you know, whatever. Um, you know, we could check it out. But uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it, social media is. It, I, I just integrated. I'm, I'm interrupting myself now. I just integrated into filmsnobbery.com, the the website, our back end. We use WordPress. Um, I just integrated a plugin called Social Metrics that I really really dig. Like I I was. I didn't know 100% what it was um, until I installed it, and what it does is it, for every post that we put out, now for us it makes sense because we put out, I mean every review we do is a post, every interview we do is a post, whatever, uh, for production for you guys may or may not make sense unless you're doing like daily updates and stuff, but what it does is it tracks um, all the social reach that your post has done across Twitter, Facebook, I think it's StumbleUpon, Dig, and LinkedIn. And um, it will tell you like how many retweets, how many shares, how many, all that kind of stuff for each post. And not only, you know, if you're looking at the, the actual dashboard of it, the cool thing is, is if you're like, oh, I forgot to put it on LinkedIn or something like that, you can just click on the LinkedIn button and it'll share it out automatically. For me, I, I, I used it for like five minutes and I was sold on it. And by sold, I mean I didn't pay a cent for it. There is a, a premium model, but the free version is awesome. So um, if you guys are using WordPress as your back end, <clears throat> look up the plugin called Social Metrics. Uh, really awesome. I actually have an article coming out on MasteringFilm.com soon. Um, for uh, I give uh, five plugins that are good for filmmakers. Um, I have another one that's coming up um, that also addresses checking your what I like to call checking the box office uh, for and, and uh, which you know for filmmakers uh, would mean you know it's it's really more of like your online box office tech stuff like you know, your Google Analytics, checking your, you know, uh, social analytics and all that kind of stuff. So we've got a couple articles coming out in the near future on MasteringFilm.com that I wrote that uh, will address some of that stuff. So hopefully that will answer some more questions down the road. Um, or at least we'll give you guys some hints and, you know, cool things that you guys can try and look out for. So anyways, <clears throat> um, let me see here. <clears throat> uh, da -da -da -da. Let's see. Dead. I know, but I'm I'm trying to look at the I'm trying to look at the, the the chat room to kind of like get some more things to talk about, and there's really nothing specific to you know. There's no other questions or anything like that. So um, I think that that Nathan, that is true. I'll just throw that out there while you're looking if you're looking for something in the chat. I, I told him that I have a Warhol postcard on. Uh, you know, I have like a cat. Uh, my dresser has like all postcards and stuff. That yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a water hole right next to a mini poster of Say Anything. Yeah, he has a, a postcard mosaic on, on his, uh, on his like, closet door uh, or yeah, cabinet door. Yeah, projections on the other side of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually have the Waterhole poster is up, um, it's right over there, the signed one that we have. It says, Nick, Nick thanks for the support. And it's signed <coughs> by Nathan, and it's, uh, yeah, it's right there. It's actually right next to a Heart of Now poster, which is also right next to a New York Lately poster. And my What's Up Lovely poster is right there, too. All off camera. And your stuff like Chuck poster? Uh, I don't have a stuff like Chuck poster. <laughs> yeah, I know. Do you, don't have, do you even have a stuff like Chuck poster? Yeah. I have, like, ten of them in my closet. Why don't I have one? I don't know. Send me one, and I'll, I'll take it to L.A. with oh, me. Oh, yeah, like, I'm going to paint a mail out of it. Oh, God damn, you suck, you cheap bitch. <laughs> Didn't I give you a mini poster, though? Like, no. Like, 17? No. You never did. I swear all to God. Right. I thought I did. I have, I have a door hanger. That's all I have. Yeah, you got a door hanger. You got stickers. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> oh, you've given them all No, you, you, you took them, remember? I took them back? Yeah, you took them when we were in Orlando because you had a, it was in, remember it was in my car and it was in that like, oh, I uh. I you another stack. Yeah, exactly. It was in my glove box. I replaced stack. Okay. Yeah, so you took them all. Um. <clears throat> But yeah, I still have all you guys' posters. I'm trying to figure out the best way for me to... I want to take them with me, but there are so many different sizes of them um, that there's no like effective way for me to pack them, and I don't want to like fold them or whatever. I'd like to roll them and whatever. Plus, it sucks because they're kind of stapled to the wall, so getting them off has been a bit of a, a chore. Um, 
I ripped our one from the, uh, not bad, but just the corners. I ripped our one from the uh, our, our Day at the Palace screening series that we did. But I have, a, I have extras of that, so no biggie. Anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that was fun putting all those up when I got there. Oh, come on. We, we did, like, it only took, like, two minutes, didn't it? No, because well, because you went on to do other things while I put up the posters, and I had to pry open their uh, the shadow box. Oh and right, they had the irregular shadow box that like you gotta shove a screwdriver into the Jimmy the the door open on it and stuff. That's right. I completely forgot that like I sent you off to do grunt work while I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was taking like more than a half hour because like then like I put up the poster and then like the person that was in charge of the theater was like I don't like it there. Let's put it here. Get moving it around. I'm like, there's, it's going to be seen by the same, like, people, because it's literally, I don't like it here, let's move it to two feet this way. <laughs> like, that doesn't make sense, but okay. But, the, you know, it's, the, the thing about these posters, I'm kind of reading in the chat room, like, what people think of what I should do, and the thing is, like, I'm trying to be careful, to, like, taking them down, and it's not, like, just regular staples, it's like those, those like, uh, I don't want to call them industrial staples, but they're the, like, you know, I use a staple gun to put them in, so they're kind of thick and heavy. But what I want, like me, um, but what I wanted to say that I knew you were, I knew you were thinking it, so I was just like, I'm gonna beat them to it. Uh, but but what I want to do eventually is when I get a place and and I, it's nice and I have money to afford it, I, I want to frame all of them and I want to showcase them in my house or my apartment or wherever it is I am because I love all these posters. I mean, they're awesome. And I mean, some of them have personal notes on them. Some of them signed, like, I have one here from Angelo Bell for the Broken Hearts Club that has, like, the date on it, 8-11-2010, you know, and that was uh, shortly before, like, you know, that was, well, that was a while ago. <laughs> um, you know, we you, know have... you, you talk about, like, destroying your posters. It, it reminded me, do you remember, I don't think, well, I don't know if you were there at the, the end of the second screening of Stuff Like Chuck at the Staten Island Film Festival, when after the screening let out, we all, like, came out of the, after the Q&A and everything, we came out, and I just saw the volunteers ripping my posters yes. off the wall, and I went ape shit. <laughs> and I'm like, where are the posters? And they're like, oh, we're, we're, we're keeping them all in a safe place, we're rolling them up. And I saw people ripping them off, and I'm like, no, 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 one, one, student, uh, one student at the school there stole one of the posters. Yep. And then, like, I had four, like, full-size posters up, and I was able to recover two of them. And one of them was stolen, and another one, apparently, they're like, oh, we're going to get it back to you. We're folding all the posters, keeping them really nice. I later found out that the volunteers just threw them all into a dumpster, Ugh. and so no one got their posters back. <coughs> so that was fun. That's rough, because those are expensive. They know? are. Yeah. Well, I got lucky, though. I, I got a, a really good deal on the posters. And Usually, though, they're real quick because to get it cheap. While I have Gary King here in the chat room, I have to ask him directly, uh, did you ever end up calling or using that contact that I gave you for movie posters? And if he was too expensive, let me know. Um, if you did contact him, if he was too expensive, let me know because I want to have a talk with him about offering discounts for filmmakers, uh, specifically uh, because I know that if we, if I'm going to refer a lot of work to him, I bet you I can get those prices down pretty good. So I, I just don't know if you had had an opportunity to talk to him or not because uh, Gary had put out a tweet or a Facebook message. I can't remember which one it was. Not too long ago, saying, "Hey, do you know anyone who prints out posters? You know, for for stuff." And uh, I had given him a, a contact of mine. And uh, I just wasn't sure 100% if he had gotten in contact or not. So anyway. Well, while we're still on the subject. Oh, fuck uh, Mr. Print. <laughs> well, well I like got print instead. Um, but Paul Osborne, uh, director of Official Rejection, uh, his balls. Let's, let's throw that in there too for Nathan. Nathan uh, balls. Yeah, and one of his uh, like pieces of, of advice that I think is in Official Rejection, or it's at least on the DVD, is you buy your movie posters, your one sheets in bulk. Because a lot of times you can get them cheaper. Like from like a site like Got Print, you can usually get I think a thousand posters full size shipped for like five hundred bucks. Uh, and that's a lot cheaper than if you're buying like one or two for thirty or forty bucks from like a local print shop or stuff. So sometimes you can buy them in bulk a lot cheaper and that's why yeah. he's giving them away. Uh, and you see them giving them away in the movie like they used to give away official rejection posters. Right. 
But yeah, like there, that's one of the that's a little tip out there that. Well, and here's the thing the too, like buy, if the ruin ha- like store shitloads of posters. Well, here's them. here's another tip as well that I don't think that you guys know about is that especially you know with my guy, like if I know that you know three or four of you guys need posters, but you only need like five or six of them a piece or ten or twenty, whatever the the amount is, if we put all the orders in at once, it doesn't matter that it's three different posters. It's the paper, you know what I mean? That's you know the paper and the the, the ink or the costs. So. So, I mean, that's, okay. but, Darren you know. just said he got $45 per poster. Yes. Yeah. See, I, I paid $10 a poster. Yeah, see, here's the thing. Posters. E- even if, well, first of all, here's the deal, Jerry. No one's going to compete with online pricing. That's just what it yeah. is. But this well, guy is a, a local, like, he's a, you know, like a mom and pop shop. But, you know, I wish you would have told me, Gary. I would have been happy to talk to him and, and, and talk him down for you because I probably could have gotten you a decent deal. Um, but the fact is, is that if you guys are doing, um, if you guys are doing, uh, you, know, mul- you know, if I know enough people are doing these multiple prints, submit them all at once, and you probably get a n- really nice, healthy bulk discount. So, anyway. Okay, everyone's asking <coughs> where I got the poster. So, Zazzle, um, uh, you, can cr- you can have, like, a store online, too, where people can buy your posters and stuff. The thing is, usually a 27 by 40 poster is going to cost you, like, 40 bucks on that site. Uh, sometimes, like, it, it depends on the pricing on it. Uh, if you buy in bulk, usually there's, like, a 10% discount. But every once in a while, they'll do a massive, like, 50% off posters. Right. And then they'll do, add on and do, like, if you buy them between, like, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on this Friday, you'll, there's an additional 20% off or something. Right, but... I, I got in on this great deal where the posters, I think, were 90% off. Yeah, but you know as well. You know as well as I do, though, that people, most people, rational fucking people in the world, don't watch shit like that, like you do. Well, yeah, but if you sign up for like their email, you'll you'll get like an email. Like usually every Friday they have like one of their massive sales. Right, but but, but, also what I'm kind of getting at with that too is that that was like a you know I don't want to say a once in a lifetime, but that was a infrequent event yeah, that happened that happened when you needed to have something printed. Like if Gary well, if Gary needs something but, printed tomorrow, Zazzle doesn't have that deal available. Okay, but even if that was infrequent, they often do have coupons for like twenty percent off and stuff. So usually you could still get them for around twenty five oh. to thirty, which is still cheaper than a local place. And they have very good quality. I, 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 I'm just saying, though, that you need to manage expectations is what I'm saying. Like, if, okay. you, if you literally just put out there $10 for fucking posters, you know, 27 by well, 40 that's posters, saying, that's, yeah, you need to quantify that with it was a special I was, sale. I wanted to clarify it, and I was going to actually say something, and then you interrupted me. Yeah, oh. And then I started talking in the chat room, and I was like, this is going to go on too long. Let me just bring it up on the show. Oh, they, n- nice backtracking. Okay, we'll allow that. Um, so, anyway... Um, I don't have a beef with Vistaprint. I just find all... Uh, just uh, David Foldy in the, the, the chat room asked what's my beef with Vistaprint. I don't have a beef with Vistaprint. Actually, their, their, my, their business cards were the first business cards I ever had. The problem I do have with them, and they are cheap, but they're limited, and they... Honestly, I was never very happy with the quality. I always felt that they felt very like, I could have made this at home. Um, you know, and, and the, the cards themselves were a little on the thin side. They didn't feel like they had any substance to them. Um, you know, I, yeah, but your I, first 200 are free. Yeah, oh, yeah, no shit, right? <laughs> but here's the, and, you know, here's the thing though. I mean, I use, um, I use Moo. I love Moo.com. Not only because their standard size business cards are, uh, well, they're not even standard size. They're European size, so they stand out a little bit more. The card stock is always thick. Um, you know, they have a nice they're little screen. Expensive, though. They're expensive, I, I, but fuck if you don't get what you pay for. And then the mini like cards, the Moo I minis think- are the shit. Oh my god. And no, if, and I I don't know. I, Jerry, I've seen the stuff that you got from from Got Print, and I, I'm not saying I don't like it, but I will still go with Moo. Well, I buy the cheaper stuff because I but buy I the more expensive stock. I've gotten things from Got Print too. I, that's where I got my postcards for um, my, my, my postcards for when I went to and did my uh, I love you, but I want to see other movies at the Sidewalk Film Festival in in, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, yeah, ship them to my house. Yeah, is that, no, no, no. I had um, I had my business card shipped to your house, didn't I? Okay, yeah. I had something shipped to your house. I think it was yeah. no, it was Indiegogo swag to give I away. You had something of your own shipped to my house too. And maybe I did. I don't remember. I no, I did. It was my business cards and the to Indiegogo them, swag. Yeah, to get them in time for. Yeah, uh, I got the yeah. business cards while I was while I was at your house. And I got the Indiegogo swag when we came back. 
Yes. There we go. And then, anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, for those of you guys who followed all that, um, I, I just, I, I like what I got for Got Print, but I had to, I paid for the quality, you know, and, and I find that they, that's what's going to happen anywhere. Like, the higher quality you want anything, the more it's going to cost. And, you know, with Moo, at least it's straightforward enough and, like, very, like, it, especially once you've already completed one order, to, the, the reorder ability is just like, here's a button, boom, done. And, you know, whatever. And I love the Moo mini cards. People love those. Um... I love the ability to be able to do multiple, you know, fronts and backs, like multiple versions of it in the same order. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I love about Moo. Um, Vistaprint, they just feel cheap. Don't get me wrong, they're quick, they're, they are inexpensive, but they feel cheap. Anyways, I was going to use them for our t-shirts, but they're t even, even making t-shirts with them is a pain in the fucking ass, and they don't even do custom graphics. They have to, like, you have to, like, pick stuff from theirs, and, and, and the stuff that I wanted to use, just, it looked like garbage. It just, I was very dissatisfied. That said, their customer service is good. I'll give, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give that to them. They're better than Charter. <laughs> um, their products are shit, but I love their customer service. Pretty much. Um, I, I think if you are just getting started in the industry or something like that, and that's all you can afford, fine, go to Vistaprint. But if you want to make it's better than printing out on computer totally. paper and then cutting it out. Yeah. Like, and, not even the Staples brand that with, like, perforated edges. Like, I've seen people actually just print out on regular computer paper. I've seen it, too. And cut it out. Yeah, I totally... Actually, Becca, I got one of those. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You're... you're even though you're a short filmmaker, you're still a Tribeca. See, you guys all, I, I mean, I say you guys all, I, I, I don't mean necessarily my audience that's, that's, you know, here watching this in the chat room, but anyone who's out there watching this, you have to understand that, like, your presentation when you go places is a, a mark of how people react to you and, and your movie. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, and, and part of that presentation is what you they leave with. It's not just necessarily your first impression, but it's also what you leave them with. That means your postcards, your posters, your business cards, shit like that. And um, I collect business cards. I love business cards. I, I love the seeing the creativity and the, the, the effort that goes into making I, that I've impression. I've seen some clever ones that are really cheap. Like, um, I saw, I, again, at Tribeca for the movie Con Artist, the, the director of that movie, I, Forgot his name off the top of my head, but he actually, but I remember his business cards. See? He printed his business cards on um, pages ripped out of a black and white marble notebook. Huh. But it was like a, a, a thicker sheet, but it was, it, it was a, from like a black and white notebook. And he ripped them out, and it was like sketching. And it was because he did a movie about like an artist and that did sketches and stuff, and it it really worked. It just it fit the mood of the film, and it, it was memorable. But they were cut to regular business card size, and that's it, obviously cheap. He could have printed them off his home computer. <coughs> so I, I thought that was kind of cool. And that's you know you can do that cheap and creative, but just cheap isn't good. There you go. So uh, anyways, people. Um, I think that you know we've talked a little bit about the uh, uh, we've talked a little bit about the you know kind of uh, leveraging social media and stuff like that. We talked about different platforms. At the end of the day, you want to you know we you want to play both of them uh, to their strengths, but also cross promote between them and make sure that you know uh, people know that all of them exist um, that you're using. Uh, we talked a little bit about Pinterest. We talked a little bit. One thing. One last thing I want to talk about before we get out of here. Uh, Jerry, is uh, I want to get the audience's response on this new thing that uh, that uh, is just coming out called uh, Tug.com. Um, we saw a, a kind of a, a version of this back in the day, uh, about a couple years ago, with this thing called Open Indie, which I know that at least two of the filmmakers that are in the chat room have been on uh, in terms of platform. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Tug, Tug is basically Open Indie, but yet they have partnerships with uh, actual theater chains. Um, I signed up to Tug as actually as an event promoter, as someone who will put on events for uh, filmmakers um, and screen movies. So uh, just getting that out there now. I'm not 100% behind the platform because I haven't seen it perform yet. I'm not a fan of the demand model per se because demand does not necessarily always translate into sales. Um, it has been proven in certain cases, but not everywhere. Um, but uh, I want your opinions on this kind of new platform. If uh, you please could put it in the, 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 the chat room here and whatnot. 
So, yes. <laughs> Clumsy monster, Nathan, our guest that was just on. <laughs> Open Indie will save us all. Yeah, hey, first you have to get mad. And, you know, look, I, I say that we're all joking around. I admire uh, the passion that went into that project. Uh, I, one thing I don't admire is the lack of forethought and the the management that went into it. Um, it was I just felt it was it was always managed as a side project and never as a business, which sucks for people who donated twelve thousand dollars on a Kickstarter campaign to get that site built. And for those of you, yeah, I don't know. I, I just it pisses that me. That money could have been spent on something better, like stuff like Chuck Two. I knew you were gonna fucking say that. I, I knew it. Uh, but we're mad as hell, and we're not going to do anything about it. Exactly. Um, at first glance, you have a meeting with them next week. Well, include me in that meeting, Bill, while you're there. You can be my proxy because, like I said, we are signed up as an event promoter for them, and uh, I'd be interested in to hear what they have to do. So feel free to be the film snobbery proxy while you're there. Um, and P.S. You still owe me uh, some some information about other things. Uh, so let me know if there's any news on that because I'm two weeks in now and I don't know what the fuck's going on. So anyways, um, so let me see here. Uh, is that going to be email with the first uh, Let's see here. Uh, I am looking for a, anyone, anyone at all have, <laughs> um, anyone have any information about Tug, about what's going on with it and Anyone? I'm, I'm looking literally to the audience here. I know you guys are kind of talking amongst yourselves right now, but it would be very nice to have an opinion. I'm also going to go look at Twitter real quick to see if there's anything well, uh, While there. we're waiting for someone else's opinion, do you want to talk about what we talked about before the show? Like, what, about Tug? About Where Basically, what, they need to <coughs> team up with someone, or they need to like yeah. get the next paranormal activity in order for them to beat Demand It. Basically. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing too. I mean, like, there is something like this that already exists, and we already saw that with Open India. It was an argument I had about Open India a while ago. Um, what makes this different? Aside, do you think that the that partnering with actual theater chains is going to make a difference in this case, Jerry? Um, possibly. I don't know. It depends on what type of films they're gonna like use. I mean, like, if they're going with AMC theaters and stuff. Odds are it's not going to be indie films that AMC is going to want to promote at their theaters because they don't really show indie films. So, like you said, it was AMC that they they. I I said that, but I could have been wrong. I, it was okay. like it was like AMC or National Amusements, or it was like it, what I was saying was it was an actual chain that you've heard. Yeah, of. it was like a nationwide chain, but still, like most nationwide chains are not gonna don't have indie films. And then uh, Nathan says I should go to the Phoenix Film Festival. I. I'm going to have enough t trouble getting to Los Angeles. You want me to go to Arizona? I used to live in Arizona, so I'm very familiar with Phoenix, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, Zach says, Open Indie actually worked for me, but only once. I'd be interested in hearing that experience, by the way. Uh, they post, uh, providing a platform for individuals to rally their homies to fill screening of a film they want to see. Um, yeah, that, that's... Which, but that's uh, pretty much what demand it is, and that's yeah. what Open Indie tried to be. Yeah. But the thing is, they, they don't sell tickets. And that's what we were saying was the, pro the big problem is, like, they're not pre-selling Exactly. Tickets. Well, let me, let me read you guys the email that I got from them today. Uh, maybe this will, this will uh, enlighten a little bit. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Um, here it is. It's from uh, one of their marketing people. <clears throat> it says, uh, hey, Nick, thank you so much for applying to create Tug Events, which really just sounds dirty. Uh, my name is um, Person, insert person name here, and I help promoters plan their first screenings. During our pilot stage, we'll be working closely with you to create your events. It would be great to speak with you further about how Tug works and what is involved in creating a screening. Uh, believe me, I know how to Tug. It's not something that's a... I, I was going to say, this sounds like the open indie for adult films. Exactly. Um, do you want to, instead of demanding it, it's like, do you want to Tug it? But here's, here's, the, here's where it gets into the actual process. Uh, below, I've outlined the process step by step. One, confirm that we have an in-network theater in your town. Two, choose a film from the Tug Library. I'll send this over to you based on the types of films you'd like to show. Just three, decide the details for the screening, time, date, special features, etc. Four, create, uh, then it says Tug creates an official event page for your screening. Uh, five, you spread the word to your friends and community. 
Six, get enough RSVPs and your event is confirmed. And then seven, join your friends at the theater and enjoy the film. So uh, please let me know when you're available. We can arrange a time to talk more and get you started on your first tug event. All the best, person. Um, that, so it sounds like basically what they do is they create, you know, very similar to what Eventbrite does, like where you create an event and there's an event page. That's where people buy tickets. I think Brown Paper Tickets probably does the same thing, um, all that kind of stuff. And um, they're, so basically it seems like they're providing the venue and they're providing the, the, a promotional outlet. But it still doesn't solve the problem of um, even if, all right, so I have 13,000, over 13,000 followers on Twitter. I get, a, I get 500 of those people to sign up an RSVP to an event. At which point, wait, 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 how wait. many You're of them... You're not going to get that many people just because, like, 500 people in one location that can attend, like, that's... I'm just, I I, I'm just, I'm speaking I know, I know, purely I know. in hypotheticals here. There was no reason for, reason for you to interject right there. Anyway, so, so, oh, God, you suck. So if you get, say, 500 people to, to go ahead and RSVP, which I know is like an impossibility, however you want to frame it, um, but if they do that, to me, that's still, that demand does not necessarily still translate into ticket sales, and that is the part that I think all of these platforms, demand it included, um, Eventbrite is the only one that I feel, I, I feel that they, they have a, it, it relies a lot on, on uh, obviously you still have to book everything yourself, but at least when they're selling stuff, they're selling the ticket, you know, like to the event. Um, and they have obviously the check-in ability and all that kind of stuff on the event side. I know that Bill uses it for the First Glance Film Festival when we were in Philly. Um, you know, he basically had people that were buying their tickets on uh, using Eventbrite, I think it was Eventbrite. And then people come in, and you could either scan the ticket or you could check them in via their uh, interface on their show, on their uh, website. So it's, yeah, it's just a thing. Um, uh, yeah, so in the first one, so yeah, they book the theater if you can sell enough tickets to the event. But the thing is, is also, um, what if two shows want to book the same night, you know? Or what if, I don't know, it's like... I don't know if they, I don't think they book a certain night. I think it's like... If you can demand, if you get enough demand of people that are like, I'm going to go, I'll go see it if you can get it here. Right. And then you have like certain number of people that are like, yeah, I'm going to go and do it. Then they book the theater on a certain night and they're like, okay, this is the night. Now tell everyone, and now and they mass email everyone that like said that they were going to go see but it. But that, that to me like, lessens your chances even more. Because yeah. then you're like, well, yeah, I wanted to see it, but I can't make it on that night. You know what I mean? Or it's like, you know, if you have a, a working theater that it's like a, a, a what do you call it like a, a multi-screen theater a, a, you know something like that multiplex you know where is this movie playing like you know what theater is it are they gonna give me one of the good theaters am i gonna get the shitty theater what if i booked 200 people and the theater only holds 100 you know because they gave me the smallest theater in the building you know well, there's I, a, I think that they'll they're not gonna like book you a smaller theater than what you have but like how do they like are, are they buying the tickets how, how does that work? Like, how do they get the tickets? How do they purchase the tickets? That's the, yeah, that's that's the part I'm trying to figure out. It's like, at what point does the money aspect go in? You know, like, I wanted to... What, what be, would be ideal, I think, is that, like, when someone demands it or whatever, they pay, like, the price of the ticket. And then, if the event doesn't happen, like, it, like, but, the, like, like, you, like, it's kind of like a Kickstarter type thing, where it's like, if the event doesn't happen, the money, the money never gets taken from your account. But if the event does happen... Like, you pre-booked it, and, like, you set a date. Like, you actually do set a date, and it's time for it. And then it's like, if you don't have enough people that that pre-buy their tickets by this time, the event doesn't happen, the money goes back. I, I don't necessarily hate that idea. I mean, I, at some point, there has to be a pre-sale going on here, not just a promise, you know, or, a, or you know, because that... Promises can be broken, but money talks and bullshit walks. You know what I mean? Like it's you, you. You need to have even if it's like you can buy the ticket. You can only pay like you know even putting a down payment on a ticket, so to speak. Or if you're doing the presale, like you said, doing a Kickstarter model where if the event doesn't happen because of, you know enough demands don't go in, you don't get charged or you get charged back. However you wanna you wanna uh, view it. Um, or you, you know what the event doesn't happen and. Uh, 
or the event does happen, you don't show up, you still got charged. So, I mean, it's still like, you know, there's a seat there. You know what I mean? Like, that seat has, quote unquote, still been sold. Um, I think that that's the only way that I think theaters are going to very, you know, more theaters. I mean, obviously, Tug has relationships, but it, I think that that's how you're going to get more theaters to, to buy into something like this, as well as you're going to get more, um, you're going to get more filmmakers to buy into it. Because the other part I haven't seen on this is the where's the revenue share? I want to know where's the revenue share for booking this movie, not only as an event promoter, but also as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, where is your, where, where's your money that you're getting from, from using this service to get your movie uh, into a theater? Because just getting it into a theater and getting 100 people to see it does nothing for you. I mean, I hate to say it, folks. Four walling sucks. It, it, wall to wall. Getting 100 people to watch your movie in a fucking theater is not that big a fucking deal. Okay? It's getting those 100 people to, do, to, to, to pay you, you specifically, to see that movie. That's where, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a question of money. You know, um, I hate to say it. And, uh, you know, I want to know what's in it for you. And, and, yes, also, what's in it for me? I want to make money doing events like this, too. I don't want to, you know, putting in time and effort in my name, and not only my name, but film snobbery's name onto something that we can't earn a return off of. So, you know, we do that enough. So, anyway. Um, eh, it looks like a lot of people are taken off, so I think that might be a, uh, a good time to... Uh, Let's see. Anyway, uh, well, I guess I, I'm just reading the, the uh, first glance here. just said, uh, looks like the platform tug holds the money from ticket sales, and if you hit the threshold, they book a screening at the venue in a night they decide on. Seems like a four wall with a middleman. I might be wrong, but that's what I see. If, if that's the case, though, like, you're going to pay, like, you don't know when the screening's going to be or anything. You're just going to pay, like, whatever, $10 for a ticket and hope that you'll be able to attend it? Yeah. Like, yeah. That seems weird. Yeah, it does. I mean, the whole thing, I... I, I I would, I mean, the lady that, uh, I, I'm kind of <clears throat> giving away more information, but the lady that contacted me from Tug <coughs> about making and promoting events, I definitely would like to have a conversation with her and kind of get more details for you guys out there because my my goal is I want to know what's in it for you. Um, I'm happy to put on screening events all day, every fucking day, but my whole goal is I want to make sure that you guys are getting something out of it, and yeah, I'm, I'll be selfish. I want to get something out of it too. So... We'll, uh, we'll see what, what happens with that, so more news as it develops, I guess they say. And uh, that is going to be the, uh, the end for, for tonight, Film Snobbery Live. I want to thank our guest that came on. I want to thank Nathan Cole. Uh, you can follow him at uh, twitter.com slash waterhole movie. You can also go to uh, his website, uh, www.thewaterholemovie.com. And uh, I want to thank everyone who came to the, uh, the show tonight, Mojave Musing, Clumsy Monster, which is Nathan, uh, Zach Forsman, Gary King, uh, Repo Man, uh, pr pretty much anyone else. I want to thank our winner who won the contest tonight uh, for uh, a free signed copy of The Waterhole. I want to thank, uh, where is he, Matt Jones. And uh, I want to remind everyone you can follow us. Uh, over at Twitter, twitter.com slash filmsnobbery, facebook.com slash filmsnobbery, youtube.com slash filmsnobbery, filmsnobbery.com. Uh, and uh, check us again next week uh, and uh, every Thursday night for uh, at filmsnobberylive.com, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for now anyway. And uh, we'll have uh, more great guests for you guys uh, for the next few shows. And then we're, uh, we're going to go dark for a little bit while we make our trek over to Los Angeles and start preparing a brand new show for you guys. Uh, also, keep an eye out, please, 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 please. March 1st is when we're going to be launching our Indiegogo campaign for our uh, little trek out to the West. And um, we would appreciate anything that you guys can do to help out. So thank you very much, and we'll see you guys next week. Uh, have a good one.